Glory Days, the Catholic League of New Orleans is made possible by our presenting partners. Domino's Pizza, the pizza delivery experts. First NBC, your community bank where you matter, and AT&T, rethink possible. And by the New Orleans Saints, Lakeside Camera Photo Works, Buson Creative Strategies, the Almar Foundation, Capital One Bank, Gibbs Construction, Southern Eagle Distributors, New Orleans Museum of Art, Generosity Media, and the Tipitinas Foundation. For every yard gained, there is glory. And that glory has gained a collective hold on the culture of New Orleans. Today, as professional athletes dominate the front page headlines, football's real story around here is played out by local high school heroes on the city's fields of dreams, where the journey is the only reward. Each year, hundreds put on a uniform. Thousands fill the bleachers, Loyalties run deep, rivalries are legendary, and with every win or loss, there's always a story. Over the last six decades, one district has maintained its tradition of excellence both on the field and in the classroom. To the Louisiana High School Athletic Association, it's District 10 5A, but it's best known as the Catholic League. On December 7, 1895, Dyer and Farrell, two small military academies, took to the field and the seeds of prep football in New Orleans were planted. The two schools, now nothing more than historical footnotes, were located just blocks apart on Coliseum Street. And the final score between them was even closer, Dyer scoring the game's lone touchdown, winning 4-0. Tulane, which had begun its football program a year earlier, uh, was trying to find a way to uh, supplement his team or to replenish it when the players would either quit or graduate. And so they came up with the idea we'll have this little Saturday morning prep league. And that they discovered that these little schoolboys had very little talent, speed, a size, and uh, they were disappointed in what they saw, and after one game, they canceled the rest of the season. But the seed had been planted, and now the sport needed time to take root. 20 years and many forgotten games later, football took hold in New Orleans with the beginning of the city's first great rivalry between Warren Easton and Jesuit in 1915. St. Aloysius fielded its first team in 1921, and Holy Cross followed a year later when its booster club raised $150 to pay a coach. The rivalry between Holy Cross and Jesuit, and Jesuit and Warren Easton, were instrumental in uh, building the interest 
in high school sports over the decades to what it is today. Rivalries like this were one reason the sport gained ground. You had very little radio competition, no television competition at all. So if you wanted to see it, you had to go attend the game, or if you couldn't attend, your only touch was the newspaper. And in time, high school sports conquered the city's newspapers. High school games had the front page of the sports page, headlines. All through the sports page, uh, they had uh, stories about prep football. So it, it was the dominant uh, game. Prep football began to take hold on the culture of the Crescent City. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, we played at City Park Stadium at least four, three or four times my senior year in the 20,000 population range per game. And, uh, and even in those days, City Park Stadium wasn't large enough for some of the real big games. In 1936, the Jesuit Warren Easton game at Tulane Stadium drew 33,000 fans, 11,000 more than the inaugural Sugar Bowl between the Green Wave and Temple two weeks later. In November 1940, City Park Stadium bared witness to the growing popularity of the game of high school football. Holy Cross and Jesuit were both undefeated and they played at City Park Stadium, which was relatively new stadium at the time. They sold the entire stadium out, which held 27,000 people, but 40,000 people came to the gate the day of the game. The only place they could put the people were along on the track, on the sidelines, and when the game was going on, quite often, as the play was on one end of the field, there were fans on the other end of the field trying to get close to watch it. It was, it was almost like old sandlot football, but 44,000 people for a high school football game in 1940. And that's what, great football days, that was the real beginning of, uh, of the real glory days of, of New Orleans prep football. The Times-Picayune theorized that more than three quarters of a million fans attended prep games in New Orleans. Even in the 50s, with the emergence of television and neighborhood movie theaters, football's popularity was booming, as was the population of the city that care forgot. By 1955, there were 11 local high schools taking to the field with six public schools and five private. The time had come to split the districts. The Catholic League was born. It was natural for the Catholic schools to have their own competition and the public schools to have their own competition. And then for a while, the winners would meet for the right to go on to the state playoffs. Uh, so that was, that was a big step. And then you started to have more of identification of the Catholic League, regardless of um, what district number it was in the state, it was always referred to as the Catholic League. This is the story of a journey rewarded and a duty done. Glory days, the Catholic League of New Orleans. September 1955, as the newly formed Catholic League prepared for its first season, Elvis Presley took the stage at New Orleans Pontchartrain Beach. The future king of rock and roll was still three months shy of recording his first number one song. Two of the top ranked eight teams in Louisiana were from the Catholic League, and De La Salle and Holy Cross looked to dominate play in 1955. But a scrappy St. Aloysius squad had a different idea. We felt we were pretty competitive with everyone in the city. There was no standout team, and if you check the scores, uh, one or no more than two touchdowns separated everybody. Despite their confidence, the Crusaders' first game against public power Warren Easton didn't go quite according to plan. Well, the first game uh, was about five days after we returned from losing 
uh, in the sectional American League and American Legion baseball tournament. And we had at least four starters on a football team that were on that baseball team. And we may have had two or three days of practice before playing East, before playing one Eastern on a Friday night. So they just wore us out, uh, 12 nothing because of our lack of preparation, lack of fitness. Things quickly turned around for the Crusaders and Coach Andy Douglas as St. Aloysius defeated East Jefferson, West Jefferson, and then took on the Catholic League. Well, the games we played against the Catholic opposition, uh, we beat Holy Cross and Jesuit both 13-0. Uh, we beat Delisau 8 nothing. Meanwhile, Redemptorist was also rolling. The Rams had upset Coach Johnny Altabello's De La Salle squad and handed Class B champion Holy Name of Mary its only loss that season. In late October, the two Catholic League leaders clashed. The winner would have the upper hand in the race for the inaugural league crown. We jumped out 7-0 pretty quick, and as a result of back-to-back of -back fumble punts, uh, we gave Redemptors great field position sometime in the third quarter when they went ahead and scored 7-7, and it was a standoff since then. So there was only one team that scored on us in the Catholic League, and that was Redemptors 7-7. The tie ended St. Aloysius' regular season, and with an undefeated district record, Coach Douglas watched from the stands as Redemptress played Holy Cross. The Rams needed a win to keep pace, but the Tigers played spoiler, running over Coach Joe Galliano's defense, carrying the ball for 250 yards and 14 first downs. The 14-7 Holy Cross victory handed St. Aloysius the inaugural Catholic League crown. Quarterback Tyrone Clark was named the Catholic League's first MVP and joined teammates Don Gaudet and Butler Powell on the All-City team. Other players who were major contributors to the Crusaders' title efforts were Ron Vinette, Howard Bodie, Roy Piku, Bob Warringen, and Andy Bourgeois, who went on to become one of LSU's fabled Chinese bandits. District championship trophy in hand, there was one last order of business the rematch with Warren Easton. We came back and played Warren Easton for the city championship. They beat us 12-0 the first game of the season. We shut them out uh, by the same token, 13-0 to win the city championship. As city champs, St. Aloysius represented New Orleans in the state class 2A playoffs, drawing the number one ranked Estruma of Baton Rouge in the first round. We played them in Tiger Stadium. Uh, very, very large crowd. I think we may have had 24, 25,000 people, mostly on, mostly favoring Estroma. We, we had maybe six or 8,000 travel up from New Orleans to the game. But uh, we were competitive. Uh, they, they jumped on top 14, nothing. We came back and scored a touchdown right before half, I think, and went in trailing 14-7 at half. Second half, they just seemed to wear us out. We were just overmatched. Maybe a little bit physically, but certainly depth-wise. They had more good players than we had. We had a few, they had a few more. Their star back, future Heisman Trophy winner Billy Cannon, went on a one-man offensive rampage, leading his team to a 33-7 victory and ending St. Aloysius' year of glory. St. Aloysius capturing the first Catholic League championship might have been a surprise, but the real revelation was what Joe Galliano was doing at Redemptress to build a future power. Over a nine-year period, starting with the team's inception in 1946, Redemptress won an average of three games per season. They, they fought really hard, and, and you knew that you were going to be in a good ball game with Redemptress because those players from the Irish Channel and that were just hard-working people. The problem is they never had enough of them, like anything else, and you could see that they just couldn't compete. That all changed when the Rams joined the Catholic League. We knew it would be a very uh, significant challenge, you know, to play against the larger Catholic schools. Uh, 
And so we, we felt that we needed to prepare and get ready. And I think that the fact that we had such an outstanding coaching staff, you know, they prepared us well. I think in 55 was the beginning of the real good teams at Redemptress in 55, 56, and 57. And I think it all uh, was because of the outstanding coaching and organization that we had at that time. After their surprising second place finish a year before, the 1956 season offered a shot at redemption for the pride of the Irish Channel. But Times Picayune writer N. Charles Wicker didn't see salvation in the Rams' future. N. Charles Wicker picked us to come in last. He wasn't the only one who thought we were going to be a poor team. We weren't picked to do anything. Wicker wasn't completely incorrect, statistically. The Rams led the league that season in just one category, wins. Terry Moran, Ronnie Doyle, and Mike Marchese anchored a solid defense, while Lester Mitz, Morris Powell, and Arthur Schmidt led the offensive charge. The final result was an 8-1-1 record, a Catholic League championship, a city championship over Warren Easton, and a series of apologies from a certain sports writer. In the end, and Charles Wicker called us the Cinderella team. In fact, uh, after we won the district championship in our yearbook, you'll find a little letter from him apologizing to us for having done that. <laughs> the Irish Channel reveled in its Cinderella story. We would be comparable to today's rock stars. Uh, we'd get back from a game which we weren't expected to win. We'd win and they'd have a lot of people just waiting in a schoolyard, not just students, but people that lived in the Irish Channel were very proud of us and made us feel good. I got hugged by more of what I thought were old ladies in those days than I ever, ever thought I would, but uh, they made you feel special. The only district game that Redemptress didn't win was against the defending champ, St. Aloysius. The Rams and Crusaders finished with a tie game for the second straight season. The two teams would have tied for the league title had it not been for a helping hand from another upstart football program, Holy Name of Mary. The ascension of Holy Name of Mary's football program was dramatic. The Algiers school hit the gridiron first in 1951, and within five years, the Blue Knights were Metropolitan League champions. Two years later, Holy Name was in, then out, of the Catholic League. One man in particular was responsible for the Blue Knights' meteoric rise to power, head coach Harry Hahn, a former Tulane linebacker. Who was like a father to all of us. Now he had his own way of doing things, and, you know, he'd howl and cuss and shake you up, but he was like a father figure to all of us. And he was the kind of guy that you talk about laying on the line for, you laid it on the line for him. He, he just instilled that in you. Because we had guys, you know, one guy in particular I can name, Roy Blanchett, he, used to, he had a, a broken leg and he wouldn't practice all week. And they'd go to the doctor's Friday morning of the game and they'd cut the cast off. And he'd play in the game and then either that, that night or the next day he'd go back, he'd come back to school money, he'd have a cast on his leg. And he did this for like six or seven weeks. You know, uh, he had to play with broken bones and everything else. I mean, that's just the way it was in those days, you know. Even with only 22 players in uniform, Han never shied away from anyone when building his program, choosing to challenge the big boys at nearby West Jeff and Berman. Well, I can remember the 54 Berman game because we had guys starting on our team in 1954 against Berman that couldn't make the JV team at Berman the year before. Okay. So he, he, he pumped these guys up and made them believe, them believe in themselves. In 1955, that belief took them all the way to the Class B championship. Holy Name only lost once that season to Redemptorist. One year later, with both teams now in the Catholic League, the Blue Knights would help coach Joe Galliano's Rams win the district title. It was the final two minutes of the final regular season game. If St. Aloysius could hold on to their 13-7 lead, they would tie Redemptorist for the league championship. Don Watney fielded a kickoff and ran his way into history. It was a Sunday afternoon at Berman Stadium. The place was packed to the gills. A minute and 10 seconds left to go on the clock. And you know, at that time, our big return man was, was Pudgy O'Connor. 
and he was in the middle and Ronnie Smith was on one side and I was on the other. And I guess they, they tried to kick the ball away from O'Connor and it just happened to the bounce where I was standing at. And uh, I, I scooped it up and uh, I took a couple of steps toward the middle as our design kickoff return was. I cut back to the right, went up the sidelines and our blocking was such that nobody even laid a hand on me. It wasn't anything, you know, as far as me making a great run of great moves or anything else. And we kicked the, uh, Camille Burry kicked the extra point. We won 14 to 13 and knocked Aloysius out the city championship and gave the championship to Redemptors High School. Coach Hahn's Blue Knights finished the season with an impressive 6-3 record, but their 1956 success could not be duplicated. Holy Name of Mary lost all nine regular season games in 1957. Due to declining enrollment, the school not only dropped down in class, but also dropped plans for a new campus. With time, Holy Name of Mary became an elementary school as Archbishop Shaw increased in size. The school was unceremoniously closed in 2009, but the echoes of the glory days of Holy Name of Mary will forever be part of the history of the Catholic League. In 1957, drive-in movies were at the peak of their popularity, but the most intriguing plot twist did not happen on a screen. It took place on the gridiron of the Catholic League of New Orleans. When the regular season reel ended, four teams laid claim to the crown, and one play divided the lifelong friendship of two legends. De La Salle's Johnny Altobello called the play, and redemptress Joe Galliano never forgave his coaching colleague. Johnny Antebella, you know, all, all week long, he had a, a, I don't know what you'd call it, a surprise play or a sneak play or something. They got a, a punt or a kickoff up between the 35 and the 50 yard line. And so the players on the sideline all were standing up along the end line, to, you know, by their bench, but right on the, on the uh, end line. And uh, 10 players ran out to, uh, to start their offensive possession, and one remained standing with all the other players. The fellow's name was Bobby Lauer, and uh, I threw it to him, and he grabbed it. He probably went down, or it was about a 65 or 70 yard play. LaSalle had a guy on the sidelines and they ran him in at the last minute, threw a pass down the field. We didn't even see him enter the game. I don't think that we saw, you know, the, the ball even being thrown. We wanted what he was doing, throwing it to, you know, to his teammates on the sideline and uh, it ended up being that, that uh, hidden player that was masked by the uh, players who were standing along the sideline. So it was a designed play. Coach Gatton Galliano came out in the field and uh, he wanted to know where the player came from. He was on the sidelines and his thing. But Johnny Altabella had talked to the referees prior to the play to let them know what was going on. So it was all fair. Later, of course, you have rules that say you have to be in a huddle and, you know, and, and so the rules later changed. But uh, it was thought to be a legal play. Uh, uh, and not considered too ethical, you know, to do something like that at that time. Uh, it really hurt Coach. You know, he was a man of dignity and honesty and uh, played by the rules. And uh, he was really upset that this was an illegal play that was used to uh, defeat us. And uh, I don't think he, I think he took it to his grave, actually. I really do. I really do. The victory gave De La Salle a commanding lead in the district, with only Jesuits standing in the way of their title. With a 12-7 lead over the Blue Jays, the Cavaliers' Don Boger grabbed a Jesuit pass. With the ball in the hands of the city's outstanding back, the crown seemed to be in the hands of De La Salle. They had 12 seconds left in the game, and, uh, and we were leading, I don't know, about three points, six points, whatever it was. And uh, I, I intercepted a pass. And then instead of going out on one knee, the game would have been all over. And, you know, we would have won the Catholic, uh, the Catholic championship. But no, I wanted to be the hero, and I, I took off down the field. And down around that 30, I fumbled the ball. 
and uh, they ran it back till about the 50, and then the father played John Altabella, took me out of the game, and he replaced it with the same fellow that threw the pass to in the Redemptors game, Bobby Lauer. And uh, lo and behold, he scored a touchdown, you know, right over him. And uh, that was one of the most embarrassing moments. Jesuits win forced a four-way tie with St. Aloysius, Redemptress, and De La Salle. They had to figure out what to do real quickly because the LHSAA told them that they had one week to come up with a representative from New Orleans for the South Louisiana State Playoffs. So they had to decide among those four which was going to go. The teams decided on a four-day, four-way playoff. In round one, Redemptress narrowly defeated St. Aloysius 7-6. And in the sequel, Jesuit had no problem beating De La Salle 33-7. On a Sunday, that was a championship game between Jesuit and Redemptress. And uh, that was quite an interesting game. I, I was lucky enough to, to play and to participate and uh, be the quarterback of the team. And we very seldom passed the ball, but somehow or another, we won our eight yard line and we threw, I threw a four yard pass out in the flat. And Morris Powell, who was one of the most elusive runners I think I've ever seen, he catches the ball and dodges all the Blue Jays and runs uh, 88 yards with it. So I set a prep record that lasts for 25 years because I was able to uh, throw a 92-yard touchdown pass. But I, in actuality, it was only a four-yard pass. And then we ran a counterplay for 92 yards, I think, also with Wayne Juno. And uh, we jumped on Jesuit real early, like 14-0 in the first quarter. In the championship match, the Rams avenged an early season loss, blanking the Blue Jays 28-0. Sometimes you get a snowballs and you start doing good and the ball bounces your way, and that's what happened to us. Surviving the gauntlet of three games in eight days, the pride of the Irish Channel won its second Catholic League title, the league's first back-to-back -back champions. But the promise of a dynasty was unkept. The second title would also be their last. Redemptress never wore another Catholic League crown. In 1980, the school itself left its Irish Channel home, moving to Gentilly and changing its name to Redeemer High School. A merger with Seton Academy came in 1994, and in 2005 came the floodwaters of Katrina, destroying the school. But the cheers of the Irish Channel can still be heard in the memories of the glory days of Redemptorist. Probably one of the greatest experiences of my life to be able to be a, grow there and to be a part of the uh, uh, history of uh, what an incredible institution. I tell people I was a ram born, ram bred, and I'll be a ram until I'm dead. We hope that you are enjoying part one of our new documentary series, Glory Days, the Catholic League of New Orleans. Glory Days represents our biggest locally produced project, and we have some great thank you gifts when you make a pledge to help support LAE. Programs like Glory Days can't exist without contributions from viewers like you, so please check out these great offers and pick up the phone and call in your pledge now. You can also go online to WLAE.com and click on the Glory Days pledge merchandise button. Now let's go to Jason to hear about all of the great gift offers we have. Jason? Thanks, Chriselle. For your contribution of $50, we'd love to send you this print of the 1940 Jesuit versus Holy Cross game at City Park's Tad Gormley Stadium. Over 34,000 fans attended this great prep contest. This print measures approximately 5 by 17 inches and will look great in your office or at home. At the $80 level, we have Glory Days, the Catholic League of New New Orleans coffee table book. This photo journal is filled with hundreds of fantastic pictures and captions from one of the greatest eras of prep football in New Orleans. Nearly all of the schools that played in the league are represented in the book. Holy Cross, Jesuit, St. Aloysius, Holy Name of Mary, Redemptress, Chalmette, Shaw, Rummel, St. Augustine, De La Salle, Coriezu, and Brother Martin. This is a must for fans of the Catholic League and is only available through this pledge offer. 
For your contribution of $100, we'll send you a DVD of the Glory Days program that you're watching now. This item will be a lasting tribute to players, coaches, and fans of the game and the league loved by so many in our city. Remember, all of these items are not sold in stores and are only available as you support public television on LAE. And of course, we have some great packages, and here's Chriselle to tell us about that. Thanks, Jason. For your contribution of $200, we'll send you our Glory Days Champions Club package, which includes the Tad Gormley poster, the Glory Days coffee table book, and the Glory Days DVD. Separately priced, these items go for a total of $230, but today they're yours with your pledge of $200. And finally, for your contribution of $300, we'll send you the ultimate Glory Days package, which includes the Tad Gormley poster, the Glory Days coffee table book, the Glory Days DVD, a Glory Days ball cap, an autographed copy of Ron Bracato's book, The Golden Game, and a specially designed poster by our artists here at WLAE. Known as the Gallery of Glory, this poster features iconic images of players and coaches representing many of the schools that played in the Catholic League. The ultimate Glory Days package is only available through this special offer on LAE. Thank you so much for supporting this incredible program on LAE. It's because of your support that we are able to bring you programs like Glory Days and all of the other great programs we produce. So please pick up the phone now and call in your pledge and take advantage of one of these great offers. The phone number is 1-800-600-2068 or you can order online at WLAE.com and click on the Glory Days Pledge Offer button. Right now, let's go to the producer of Glory Days, Tom Gregory, who's going to introduce us to a very special guest. Tom? Thanks, Chriselle. I'm joined today by a famous New Orleanian, a great actor, a Catholic school alum, and the voice of the Glory Days, Jay Thomas. Thanks for being Thank here. You. And, Thank you. And thanks for taking part. Uh, your family's had some Glory Days of its own right here on the in the Catholic League of New Orleans. Yeah, my brother played on the famous uh, uh, 1961 team that won the state championship with uh, Pat Screen, and uh, I played at Jesuit. Uh, I got hurt and didn't play my senior year, but I played uh, in the mid '60s, and uh, wrestled, and and um, ran track, and played football, and and uh, so yeah, and it was it was a, a defining moment. I always wanted to go to Jesuit. It was hard for me. I flunked the entrance exam uh, twice. Um, I had to beg my way in, and I told uh, Father Stallworth that if he allowed me in the school that he wouldn't be sorry and that I would one day, it's true, I one day would be famous and it would be okay. Um, and I, they let me in the school. And, and this is your payback for well, letting you he's dead in. now, he didn't even get to see it, too bad. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, and I played football for Ken Tarzetti and yeah, I, I'll never forget and, and it really did mold mold my life, uh, you know, for good and for bad. We do have a picture, I believe, of mm -hmm. Jay in, in, in action. In action. Jumping over somebody, pretending I'm making a tackle. Looking good. Looking good. <laughs> Look at the air you're getting on that picture. Absolutely. And you notice the guy's being pulled down by somebody else. I'm sure that whatever it was, either that run or that pass went right into my area, you know. Now, one of the things, you, obviously, cheers, the movies, radio. Right. They can hear you today. Sirius on, on, XM, right, right. But... You're also famous for your ability to knock the top off Dave Letterman's meatball. The meatball off the Christmas tree. Off the Christmas tree. Every year, w without fail, you knock it no, off. No, I failed a couple of years. He he hit it twice. I was giving you it. No, but he but he he looped a couple up there and hit it twice. But I've done it for like a dozen years. And it started with Vinny Testaverde, and I was a guest on the show, and Letterman says, "Hey, we're going to throw this ball." And Testaverde was in the playoffs for the Jets. And I was a, uh, quite a gambler at that time, and so uh, I go backstage, and and they start they're trying to hit it, you know, and Letterman doesn't invite me back out. So I go to the stage manager, and he says, "Well, you can't go back out." So I faked one way. He went to grab me. I ran back out, and Letterman went, "Oh yeah, Jay." And Vinny's, you know, trying to hit. So I grabbed the ball and you know threw like a rocket, blast it, makes the front page of all the New York papers, and took every piece of 
every bit of money I had and bet against Vinny Testaverde because if he could hit a, a meatball, then he shouldn't even be playing pro football. So that's how it started. Yeah, and every year ago. you go out, it, it's a Christmas tradition. It's it a is holiday. a tradition. It, and I tell a story, I tell the Lone Ranger story about working with uh, the Lone Ranger. And then um, the woman comes out and sings, you know, Merry Christmas, baby. And Jay, we want to thank you for stopping by, but most of all, we want to thank you for taking part of the glory days. Uh, I am really excited, and it, and it, it really is a, a big deal for me uh, to be able to put my voice to something that was such a, a huge part of, of my family's life and all of our friendships. A lot of them are built on guys we met, you know, playing in the Catholic League. And I think when people hear it and recognize your voice, they'll think it's the perfect voice for the glory days. I hope I said New Orleans every time. You I said it perfectly. <laughs> perfect Not every single New Orleans. <laughs> you would know that. Thank you very Jay, much. Jay, thank you. Thanks okay. for being a part of Glory My Days. Pleasure. And now let's go back to Jason, who's going to recap our special offers. Jason? Thanks, Tom. The number to call is 1-800-600-2068, or you can go online and pledge at WLAE. Com. Here's a recap of tonight's offerings. At the $50 level, we have the Tad Gormley poster. At the $80 level, we have the Glory Days coffee table book. At the $100 level, we have the Glory Days DVD. At the $200 level, you get the Glory Days Champions Club package. This includes the Tad Gormley poster, the coffee table book, and the DVD. Save $30 and you get three great thank you gifts when you pledge at the $200 level. And finally, at the $300 level, you get the Ultimate Glory Days package, which includes the Tad Gormley poster, the coffee table book, the DVD, a Glory Days ball cap, an autographed copy of Ron Bercato's book, The Golden Game, when prep football was king in New Orleans, and a specially designed poster, The Gallery of Glory, featuring great players and coaches from many of the schools that played in the Catholic League. Call in your pledge now, or you can go online at WLAE.com and click on the Glory Days Pledge merchandise button. Thanks for supporting public television and LAE. Now, back to Glory Days, the Catholic League of New Orleans. In 1958, America sent into orbit its first satellite. It was also the year that Destiny launched a shooting star that helped return Jesuit to dominance. Before the birth of the Catholic League, the Blue Jays ruled the gridiron. Winning its sixth state football championship in 1953, under the guidance of new head coach Eddie Taribio. Eddie Taribio was the all-state back who led Jesuit to the 1933 state championship, its first. He replaced his mentor, G. Gernon Brown, after leading St. Aloysius to its first city title in 1952. But Jesuit's return to the prep elite was just momentary. Taribio's next three teams suffered losing seasons, including a last place finish in 1955. The 1957 squad was one of the four schools to tie for the Catholic League title. Even with the loss in the playoffs, there was hope again on Carrollton and Bank Street until the summer. That summer, Eddie Taribio suffered a fatal heart attack. The Jesuit priest remembered the job that uh, Ken Tarzetti did as an assistant, and they had to find a replacement real quickly because the season was just six weeks away. Tarzetti had gone to Holy Cross to become head coach, but he only stayed one year and then left the city. The Jesuit priest decided this was the man that was going to resurrect the program, and they had to find Ken Tarzetti, and they had to find him fast. So they went and got Ken Tarzetti, who was on a shrimp boat in Biloxi. That's where he was out of coaching and teaching. He had left Holy Cross the year before in November, went over to Biloxi and was working on a shrimp boat in there, and the Jesuits drove over to Biloxi and convinced him to come over and take the job in 1958. They lured the controversial coach back to the city with a sizable raise as bait, and the storied Jesuit football program was now run by Ken Tarzetti. Wonderful guy. Um, not one you're gonna talk too much. He was burdened with some uh, health problems. Um, he didn't show us those health problems. But watching him coach a football game was magnificent. 
he was a big man. I remember he was very tall and uh, rangy and uh, just uh, had a command presence about him that uh, you respected him. He could get the kids to run through a wall for him. I think he was actually coaching down, meaning I think he could have coached college level. Nobody called him coach, everybody called him Mr. Tarzetti. Mr. Tarzetti was going to turn the program around. A couple of times if guys screwed up, he'd break the clipboard on top of their helmet, you know, pow, <laughs> to try to get their attention. And of course, he got everybody's attention, you know. On the field, it was Tarzetti's multiple strategies that got the attention of players and opponents alike. As a game goes along, Ken's going to outcoach their guys. And we believe that. Because Ken could, could change on the fly. He changed formations, he changed plays at halftime. And it was fun to know that a lot of people thought that our coaching staff was better than theirs. The Jesuit coach built a single wing offense that gave defenses multiple problems. He would change our offense just about every week to fit the weaknesses that he thought the other team had. He stayed in a single wing because nobody, nobody could figure out how to defend it. It was just a bunch of people right in the middle. All kind of things going on back and forth. A little smoke and mirrors back there, but it was a tremendous offense. Nobody ran it. Nobody could, could learn how to defense it. In 1958, Tarzetti's single wing offense was built around two outstanding backs, Adrian Colon and fellow senior Mike Rooney. And they were gonna carry the Jesuit hopes for that year. In the season opener, Colon goes down. The next week, Mike Rooney suffers a career-ending injury. Sent in was James Patrick Screen, and Jesuit was ready to launch its return to prominence. Who the golden boy, Pat Screen. You just would go, wow. Pat was a heck of an athlete. There wasn't no two ways about it. He was the best I've ever played with. Oh, Pat Screen was unbelievable. I mean, he's, he was a gentleman. You know, and he, but he was a super athlete at the same time. Pat Green was a real athlete. He was the best high school athlete I've seen. Could run, pass, and punt, and sell tickets. <laughs> God gave him a lot of ability, but I mean, he had to have the, the, uh, just the, the, the strength and the, and the desire to be in all those sports. Pat played baseball, track, basketball, football and he was captain of all four teams, and deservedly so, and was a 4-0 student. Pat Screen, he was raised in Gentilly, and uh, went to St. Rayfield, played on the playground, came up through the playground ranks. From the playground to Jesuit's backfield, Pat Screen entered the scoreless game for the first time in the second quarter. The field in Homo was soggy but it hardly mattered to the skinny sophomore who accounted for three touchdowns and two conversions in the Jays' 26 to 21 victory. He was fast and that was his forte. People just couldn't catch him. You know, he was, uh, he, he could make you look bad. Jesuit swept the district, but the hopes of a mythical city clash in the state playoffs with the Blue Jays' once arch rival Warren Easton didn't materialize. With an injured Pat Screen on the bench, Estruma eliminated Jesuit 39 to nothing. But the seeds of dynasty had been sowed. In 1959, Pat Screen, then a junior, and Kenny Martin, a senior, who was a blocking back earlier in his career, um, got the call to carry most of the uh, offense, in, which was a new innovative offense of multiple formations that uh, Tarzetti designed for that season. You know, these two and the Jesuits' outstanding defense made the Blue Jays a force to be reckoned with. The Blue Jays soared past every league opponent by two or more touchdowns. Martin rushed for more than 700 yards and led the state in scoring with 15 TDs. Against undefeated St. Aloysius, Martin rushed for 219 yards and scored three touchdowns, two on runs of 60 and 53 yards. If I remember correctly, it was, they, they were winning 13-0, we tied them 13-13, and then we got ahead, and, um, and then that final touchdown kind of shut the door on them, so I think it was my best game, I really, I really do. My cousin, my number was 25, and my cousin who played at St. Aloysius, uh, his name was Bob, it was Bobby Martin. 
And, um, and Bob, Bobby, uh, his number was 52, so I was 25, he was 52. And I think he was, a, in fact, he was an offensive center and a, a linebacker, I believe. And uh, so it was that extra motivation. On the final Friday night of the regular season, two teams coached by two brother-in-laws would duel for the Catholic League crown. Holy Cross's John Callbacker and Jesuit's Ken Tarzetti stood on opposite sides of the field, both wanting the same thing, a Catholic League victory. Holy Cross certainly had outstanding talent, and, and Billy Truax went on to play with LSU and then Los Angeles Rams. Uh, tackle Mike Calamari, guard Billy Ladner, and an outstanding backfield trio of George Cortez, Kenny Rappold, and Harry Nunez. But Jesuit had something that Holy Cross didn't, the touchdown twins. Down 13 to zero, Jesuit rallied to win its second straight title, 33 to 20. Pat Screen scored three times. Kenny Martin scored twice. Every time I carried the ball, I thought I was going to score. And that was my goal. And I guess it, you know, it, it showed me how important it is to set goals. I mean, I didn't set out to be the high scorer in the state, but I ended up being the high scorer in the state because every time I carried the ball, I thought I was going to score. Despite Jesuit success during its outstanding seasons, it always had one team that was frustrated, but they played them every year, Pensacola Tigers, and they played them every year in Florida. Well, Pensacola grew in three perfect seasons, 1959 and the championship seasons of 1953 and 1960. To Tarzetti, with the Catholic League title in hand, the ultimate goal in 1960 was to capture the elusive state title. So the loss to Pensacola served the purpose of pushing the team even harder. As the playoffs began, the Blue Jays were at their peak. They needed to be. More was expected from the Blue Jays when they met LaGrange in Lake Charles for the state championship. They were hot. They, you know, everything they did was just right. We couldn't do anything right at the beginning. From the outset, it looked as if Jesuit would come up short of its ultimate goal. LaGrange's defense stymied Tarzetti's offense. Screen rarely got past the line of scrimmage as the Gators pulled away to a 14 to nothing lead in the first half. It took a goal line stand for Jesuit to avoid a three touchdown deficit. We never thought we were going to lose. You know, we still, and uh, I remember somebody was surprised. I said, get your damn head up, you know. I guess some guy put his head down, you know, when they scored the second time. But get your head up. We're not losing. We're not quitting. Yeah, I hit him in the chest. And I, okay, and you know, we kept on going. Jesuit needed to make adjustments. And assistant coach Ray Coates, who was a student of every phase of the game, had calculated LaGrange's offensive strategy. They weren't going nuts on us. It was just that what they were doing was throwing a pass right over the back of the linebackers. They'd send their backs down and uh, a little bit deeper than the linebackers and hit them right in that zone behind them. And the guy kept on catching the ball and boom, you get him and you know, march right down the field with it, you know. So, Tarzetti was on me all night long, and Ray Coates. And Ray got me over and said, just back up. He says, keep on backing up until you got him in front of you. So, he backed up and backed up, and then it was went into midway in the second half that it caught him coming across and stopped going for the ball and went for him and uh, caught his attention coming across. and. He never caught another pass that night. The Blue Jays began to take flight. I thought it was a lot of confidence in the huddle and everything else, and, and you know, it was all business. Uh, no, no playing around or anything else. And we, we were there to win. And we, we lost the year before and everything else, and we wanted to win. So, Pat Screen scored on a three-yard touchdown run with 3:13 left in the third quarter. Then he capped off another drive with a run from a yard out and ran for the extra point to give Jesuit its first lead, 14-13 in the fourth quarter. But LaGrange was far from finished. By hitting the middle of the Jesuit defense, the Gators regained the lead 21-14 with less than five minutes to play. That was more than enough time for Pat Screen. 
Once again, he engineered a long drive, which he capped off with a three-yard touchdown run. With 1.48 on the clock, Tarzetti called the 66 power, and Pat Screen slashed over my brother, who was a guard on that team, a guy named Tim Terrell, into the end zone for the game-winning extra point. It was the defining moment of Pat Screen's outstanding high school career and for the Jesuit Blue Jays. It was a destiny not to be denied. Well, one thing about the state championship game was that he scored every point in the state championship game against LaGrange, okay, 21-20. He made every touchdown, he made every extra point. That victory culminated a career that places Pat Screen's name on a pedestal shared with those of Eddie Toribio, O.J. Key, Tony DiBartolo, John Pettibon, and Mickey Lanassa, a career that for Pat Screen almost didn't happen. His parents wouldn't let him play at the beginning. They, uh... They didn't want him to get hurt, you know, they saw him as a baseball and basketball player and didn't want him to get hurt and didn't like, thought football was too rough for him. So uh, it took a lot for Tarzetti to get him to finally, uh, you know, let him come on out and play ball. During the screen years, Jesuit posted a 29-5 and record and did not lose a single Catholic League game. We were lucky to have him there, but you realize you were never at his level. And so you never really thought you were Mr. Wonderful, because you, Mr. Wonderful was gone, and you're not going to get as good as he was. Pat Screen was kind of the, a hero, I think, of everybody, uh, anybody who played athletics in New Orleans. I think Pat Screen was, was a, a model to, to, to be like. In 1961, Camelot arrives, and the Cavaliers' time comes. But the story of De La Salle began 13 years earlier. In its early days, De La Salle amazingly had one man who coached every sport. His name was Johnny Altabello. Johnny Altabello might have been the fondest gentleman I've ever known. In the late 1950s, Al Tabello had developed dynasties with Cavalier baseball and basketball, winning five state championships between the two programs. Al Tabello had a lot of success as the head basketball and baseball coaches at De La Salle, but his football program was struggling. So as athletic director, he called in a real heavyweight coach, William Buck Sieber. Sieber had started the football program at Nichols in 1940, and in four years, he led them to a share of the city championship. He went on to Forche, and in two years, led them to a state championship, which is the last time an Orleans Parish public school won a state football championship in the highest classification of the state, and that was 1948. He was a wonderful coach, wonderful coach, wonderful man. Uh, very easygoing, you know, um, but he was the kind of guy just like Coach Altabella that you respected and you listened to everything he told you. By 1960, Sieber's Cavaliers were on the verge of greatness. De La Salle's roster boasted players like Erlen Griffin, Johnny Anderson, Chuck Antononi, Billy Sieber, Milo McCarthy, and Walter Johnson, and number 20, Adrian Mintel whose number had nothing to do with his unusual nickname, 88. So they took the first two letters of my name and they, they called me A.D. So I, they would say, hey, A.D. And then, you know, then the spinoff would be, hey, 80, like the number 80. Well, I spin off to that. My mother would call me in and she'd say, 88, it's time to come home, you know, and, I, and it stuck with me. But the star of the Cavaliers show was 170-pound running back Malcolm Butch Coco. Pat Screen, I thought, was a, the, the best, you know, football player in high school back then. And I'd, I'd put Butch, you know, just a tiny bit behind him. Butch was a tremendous player. In 1960, De La Salle won nine of 10 games, losing only to eventual state champion, Jesuit. The one defeat fueled De La Salle's 1961 season. Against uptown rival Forche, the Cavaliers rushed for 433 yards, and seven different players took turns scoring touchdowns 
in a 48 to nothing victory. That 48 nothing win over Fort Jay was the first step in the Cavaliers going on to win the Catholic League title and eventually become the state's runner-up team, the highest achievement it has attained in football to date. Following the 1962 season, and after just four years, Sieber resigned his post to become what was then the prestigious position of director of the New Orleans Recreation Department, NORD. He left De La Salle with a 37-8 record and ended his career with 149 victories. But for Sieber, the credit was not all his, but belonged to the great coaches he shared the sidelines with. And that was the key to it, is, is to have not only a, a great talent like he was, but to have great talent surrounding him, and it, it helped out tremendously. It also made for a successful transition when Sieber left for Nord and top assistant Lehman McHenry took over the reins of the Cavaliers in 1963. With Coco now gone, the brunt of the offense were squarely on the shoulders of Mentel and Milo McCarthy. The childhood friends made up half of the All-Catholic League backfield. Uh, the helmet he was using had a crack in the front of it. And this one particular time I'm looking at him, he's bleeding up a storm. The blood's just coming down his face. And I said, Milo, why don't, why don't you just get another helmet? And he says, I don't know, I just like this one. <laughs> he, just, he just kept bleeding and, and he'd practice with that helmet all the time and I could just never understand it. So it tells you the kind of toughness that the guy had. And uh, believe me, I'd hate to go up against Milo. He, he was just a tremendous athlete and tough as a bulldog. McCarthy scored 15 touchdowns and 16 extra points, giving him a league leading 106 points. Mintel finished his senior season as the city's second leading rusher with 995 yards. One penalty denied him of a thousand yard season. Yeah, you know I was aware of it. I'd be lying if I told you I wasn't aware of it. But, you know, like I said, I just played game to game and didn't, you know, didn't get too much into the yardage and everything. It's, it's, uh, but I was, I was proud of my achievement. Those achievements stand the test of time because of the level of competition. And not only the Catholic schools, but also in the public schools. And like you said, East Jefferson, uh, they had tremendous talent, tremendous. For Adrian 88 Mintel, there is honor in the wearing of the maroon and white. It was a good run, you know, and uh, got inducted into the Hall of Fame, which I'm extremely proud of. And, uh, you know, just, you know, good people. They, they just had good people graduate from there, and I stay in touch with a lot of them. And uh, very proud to say I went there. Pride and glory, the reward of a journey taken. Thanks so much for all the calls we've received so far. The response has been overwhelming to our pledge offers, and we just want you to know how grateful we are that you've made the decision to support this great program on LAE. We've received numerous calls from people wanting to give these offers as gifts, and we can think of no better gift to give a Catholic League alum than one of these great pledge offers. To make a pledge, please call 1-800-600-2068, or you can go online to WLAE.com and click on the Glory Days Pledge Merchandise button. So let's go to Chriselle, who's standing by to tell us again about all the great offers we have for you. Chriselle. Thanks, Jason. For your contribution of $50, we'd love to send you this print of the 1940 Jesuit versus Holy Cross game at City Park's Tad Gormley Stadium. Over 34,000 fans attended this great prep contest. This print measures approximately 5 by 17 inches and will look great in your office or at home. At the $80 level, we have Glory Days, the Catholic League of New Orleans coffee table book. This photo journal is filled with hundreds of fantastic pictures and captions from one of the greatest eras of prep football in New Orleans. Nearly all of the schools that played in the league are represented in the book. Holy Cross, Jesuit, St. Aloysius, Holy Name of Mary, Redemptorist, Chalmette, Shaw, Rummel, St. Augustine, De La Salle, Coriezu, and Brother Martin. This is a must for fans of the Catholic League and is only available through this pledge offer. For your contribution of $100, we'll send you a DVD of the Glory Days program that you are watching now. 
This item will be a lasting tribute to players, coaches, and fans of the game in the league, loved by so many in our city. Remember, all of these items are not sold in stores and are only available as you support public television on LAE. And of course, we have some great packages, and here's Jason to tell us about that. Thanks, Chriselle. For your contribution of $200, we'll send you our Glory Days Champions Club package, which includes the Tad Gormley poster, the Glory Days coffee table book, and the Glory Days DVD. Separately priced, these items go for a total of $230, but today they're yours with your pledge of $200. And finally, for your contribution of $300, we'll send you the Ultimate Glory Days package, which includes the Tad Gormley poster, the Glory Days coffee table book, the Glory Days DVD, a Glory Days ball cap, an autographed copy of Ron Brucato's book, The Golden Game, and a specially designed poster by our artist here at WLAE. Thank you so much for supporting this incredible program on LAE. It's because of your support that we're able to bring you programs like Glory Days and all the other great programs we produce. So please, pick up the phone now and call in your pledge and take advantage of one of these great offers. The phone number is 1-800-600-2068 or you can order online at WLAE.com and click on the Glory Days Pledge Merchandise Offer button. Right now, let's go to the producer of Glory Days, Tom Gregory, who's going to introduce us to a very special guest. Tom? Thanks, Jason. I'm joined today by the man who was there at the very beginning of the Catholic League and has stuck with it ever since. New Orleans foremost expert on prep sports. Please welcome Ron Bracado. Ron, thanks for being here today. Hey, thank you for having me. And more importantly, thank you for taking part of the Glory Days, the story of the Catholic League of New Orleans. Well, Tom, it was, it was um, a journey that I really enjoyed doing, just, just going back and reliving those days and uh, the stories and talking to the people who, with whom I hadn't talked before about their experiences uh, in their high school days. Is there a memory that stands out in the years that you've covered? I'm sure there's a lot, but is there one that just has stuck with you, has burned a place in your memory? Um, no one in particular, Tom. Uh, I, I think the people with whom I met, and, and the, the one thing about my memory now is that the people, the players I covered, when I started, I'm covering their sons now. And so if I ever retire, I think the signal would be when I'm covering their grandsons. <laughs> it's, it's really not the story of scores and yardage gained. It's the story of the people, the players, the coaches, the administrators, isn't it? And sports is people. It's, uh, you know, it, it's just people that compete against each other. And, and competition is what the United States is all about. And uh, yeah, it, it's, there's a lot of heartwarming stories aside from the scores. The scores change, but the people don't. What is the most important thing about the Catholic League and why is it important to the city, to the state, to the people? They just work so well together. They promote themselves, they market themselves, they play, they get the best coaches, they, have, uh, they teach the athletes. Uh, how to do the right things and it's just a high standard of academic and athletic excellence and I think that permeates throughout the state when uh, people talk about the Catholic League it, it, it's something special to them. Well we're glad Ron that you were here to talk about the Catholic yeah. League. A lot more stories to tell but thank you for taking part of uh, the Glory Day. Well thank you for having me. And now let's go back to Chriselle who's going to recap our offers. Chriselle? Thanks, Tom. The number to call is 1-800-600-2068, or you can go online and pledge at WLAE.com. Here's a recap of tonight's offerings. At the $50 level, we have the Tad Gormley poster. At the $80 level, we have the Glory Days coffee table book. At the $100 level, we have the Glory Days DVD. At the $200 level, you get the Glory Days Champions Club package. This includes the Tad Gormley poster, the coffee table book, and the DVD. Save $30 and get three great thank you gifts when you pledge at the $200 level. And finally, at the $300 level, you get the ultimate Glory Days package, which includes the Tad Gormley poster, the coffee table book, the DVD, a Glory Days ball cap, 
an autographed copy of Ron Bracato's book, The Golden Game, when prep football was king in New Orleans, and a specially designed poster, The Gallery of Glory, featuring great players and coaches from many of the schools that played in the Catholic League. Call in your pledge now, or you can go online to WLAE.com and click on the Glory Days Pledge Merchandise button. Thanks for supporting Public Television and LAE. And now back to Glory Days, the Catholic League of New Orleans. Every season since 1922, there is Jesuit and Holy Cross. Every year since the boosters of Holy Cross raised that $150 to hire a coach, these two schools have battled. Jesuit Holy Cross, when you mention that, that's special. For the first eight years of the league, Holy Cross's glory days seemed to be a thing of the past. That was about to change. When Ken Tarzetti left Holy Cross, he recommended his brother-in-law, John Callbacker, as his replacement. Within a few short years, Callbacker had returned the Tigers to the top of the Catholic League, where Tarzetti's Blue Jays had already staked out a claim. No coach likes to lose. But think about it. To lose a game to your sister's husband, or to lose a game to your wife's brother, now that's a rivalry. <laughs> you can imagine your brother-in-law. <laughs> but I think they were, they, they wanted to beat each other. It was very intense. Calbacker wanted to win, Tarzetti wanted to win. He got on us, we all understood what it meant to him and family and all like that. Those two guys thought it was Calbacker versus Tarzetti. I don't even think the, the wives even spoke to one another that week at all. And uh, he let us know how important it was. Because Mondays weren't real good if you lost the Holy Cross. Tarzetti was insisted upon that. He says, they will not beat us, I guarantee you. He said, you're going to have a miserable day if you let that happen to me, you know. You know, John was a motivator in his own right as to get you ready to play. And for any issue at hand, he, was, he would uh, embellish it uh, to the uh, biggest point necessary. I think more than that, they both had talented teams. And that was more, I think it was more pride than anything else. It was a hard fought game, and when you went out, boy, you, you better play hard in that ball game. In 1962, the combatants would decide the Catholic League champion and the city's lone state playoff contender. Holy Cross staged one of its greatest performances against Jesuit. Holy Cross center and current head coach Barry Wilson remembers how the Tigers tried to overcome a 7 0 Blue Jay lead. It was 7 nothing. We took the ball down, finally at the end drove down, scored, went for two, and didn't make it. And that was really the ball game at that time. Jesuits' win gave them the championship. But in 1963, the tide was about to turn on Dauphine Street. Glory was returning to Holy Cross. They just had talent from one end to the other. I can remember in my uh, senior year, uh, I had made All-State and they had, I, I don't know, maybe three, four, five guys that made All-State. I and mean, that's how, how much talent they had. We had tremendous defense. Vic Umont was a great defensive football player, but we had good offensive players, too. Tremendous running backs, uh, Glenn Smith in particular, he, he was tremendous. The 1963 team was Callbacker's finest. It featured an array of outstanding players, including All-State fullback Glenn Smith and center Barry Wilson, both of whom were all SEC standouts at LSU and guard Vic Umont. Wilson and Umont were bookend linebackers for the 62 and 63 Holy Cross teams. And later, they coached with and against each other. Callbacker began to see the potential of platooning players. We were starting to specialize, too. We ended up playing a lot more defense, and I thought that's when the game was starting to change. You, you, you had your wits about you. You weren't as exhausted, so you, you were able to play at a different level, and I think that's when it was starting to change to uh, two platoon. Another change that occurred that year was in the expanded state playoffs. For the first time, the LHSAA would allow a second team from each district to compete for the crown. But what two teams would represent the Catholic League? Talent-wise, the best two teams in the Catholic list district that year were Holy Cross and De La Salle. But no one could count out the Blue Jays. When those guys wanted to win, 
they sucked it up and they won. Jesuits surprised the city by upending favored De La Salle. Man for man, we definitely had a better team than they did. But just that particular game, they were, they were at us. They came at us like you wouldn't believe, and uh, they, they just wanted it more than we did, you know. But Callbacker had prepared his Tigers not to overlook Tarzetti's Blue Jays. I think the first time uh, it, we, we, we really went out thinking we were going to win, and uh, we didn't think Jesuit had a good team, but they had a great team. Jesuit was good, but they wasn't like Holy Cross. Holy, Holy Cross was tremendous tremendous talent. We ended up uh, preparing awfully tough for that ball game. I remember we stayed out, we were in pads most of the week all the way up into the game, and uh, he, he worked our butts off. The Tigers beat the Blue Jays seven to nothing and won their first ever Catholic League title and their first title in eight years. The family bragging rights were callbackers for now, but the rematch lay ahead. Holy Cross would play for the state championship against a surprise foe, Jesuit. Not only did the finals mark the first time two teams from the same city in Louisiana had ever met for a state championship, but it validated the locals' belief that the Catholic League was now the epitome of high school football in Louisiana. The Catholic League, you know, just seemed to have the best talent at the time. We knew it was going to be a tough, uh, a tough ball game. Jesuits a good football team and always has players in reserve, but they were playing really well at that time. The state's best would be decided by the best of the Catholic League, where rivalries beget sportsmanship. As a matter of fact, in that game, it was a Jesuit doctor who got me ready for that game. My doctor didn't want me to play, but it was a Jesuit doctor who walked in and said, hey, if you want to play, I want to have you ready because we want to beat you with you on the field. With the Tigers' injuries, Callbacker decided on a different path of preparation for his second meeting with the Blue Jays. He kind of eased off on us for the state championship game. He took the pads off. Uh, I'd say two days prior to it, and uh, it, uh, it it really worked. He got us fired up in, in that respect. He thought we had a good team, like he said, we were going to win it if we went out and did what we were supposed to do, and we did. A midweek crowd of 27,000 people at Tulane Stadium watched Holy Cross win its first state championship since 1945. In the Battle of Brothers-in-Law, Kelbacker handed Tarzetti his second straight family defeat of the season. In September 1964, the Beatles played in City Park Stadium to a crowd of 12,000. A month later, Tarzetti's Blue Jays would beat Callbacker's Tigers in front of 15,000 in the same venue. The next year, the rivalry once again reversed fortunes with Holy Cross defeating Jesuit. 1965 would mark the last year of the family feud. Ken Tarzetti was removed from the sidelines of Jesuit. The, the administration at, at Jesuit was concerned about his uh, alcoholic problems, but we never saw it as, as, a, as a player. We had heard about it. We didn't, of course, we had an age. We didn't know what it was. And I think they told us it was time to put him in the hospital to, to, to try to correct him, and he never came out. As for his brother-in-law, friend, and rival, for the remainder of the 60s, John Callbacker's Holy Cross Tigers defeated Jesuit's Blue Jays each year. Callbacker went eight and three in the decade. Yeah, I learned John Callbacker loved his coaching peers. No matter, he loved to beat him bloody on weekends, but his door was always open to a coach who wanted to know about other teams. He opened his mind of his secrets to these coaches because he, he really cared about them. He cared about them being successful, as long as it wasn't against his teams. And he was truly a coach's coach. John was the one person when I became head football coach at St. Aug that I could go to and talk to about the league and talk to him about, uh, you know, what a young coach should do. Uh, and he, he did a lot for me. I, I always appreciate him, always thank him for what he had done for me, you know, during, that, during those early years. Because of Coach John Callbacker and those he touched, because of Ken Tarzetti and Lou Brownson and those who coached before and after, and because of the players who have put on the uniforms of the Holy Cross Tigers and the Jesuit Blue Jays, this storied rivalry has become bigger than a game. 
It has become the continuous commitment to city, to the duty of competition, and of glory gained. In the 12 years since the birth of the Catholic League, New Orleans has changed. By 1966, integration has begun to take place in the public schools. The 24-mile-long Causeway Bridge that connected Jefferson and St. Tammany parishes has opened. The crew of wrecks began to throw doubloons, and City Park Stadium was renamed for its longtime superintendent, Tad Gormley. The name change from City Park Stadium to Tad Gormley had little effect on the crowds who continued to show up in large numbers. And, you know, it's typical in New Orleans. It seems like no matter what changes, nothing really changes. Following two years of incorporated Bayou area schools, the Catholic League returned to normal. Gone were Thibodeau, Terrebonne, and South Terrebonne. Enter the Archbishops Rummel and Shaw. The players once again knew each other. And that was the real beauty, I think, of the Catholic League back then, is because you knew all these guys. You knew the parents. You, you went, we played nard ball together growing up. And when Saturday night came or Saturday afternoons, you, you forgot the friendship. But it was fun playing against your friends. The district returned to the neighborhoods. It's area of town against area of town. You had Shaw, Rummel, Jesuit, De La Salle, St. Aloysius, Redemptorist, and Holy Cross. Everybody is, is, is territorial, and our group's going to beat your group. And whoever made it to the top stood a good chance of going all the way. Whoever is the best team is going to go on and represent the, the whole area, the city, for the state. And we knew they'd have a hell of a good chance of winning state championships. If you got through this one, you were ready for everybody. The odds were the two teams left standing would be from Mid-City or the Ninth Ward. They can talk about, oh, this game's a robbery, that game's right. Uh-uh. When Jesuit Holy Cross play, it's the game. The legendary rival had future legends in their midst. And, of course, the big star at Holy Cross at that time in 1966 was Butch Dewey. Herman Butch Dewey, a Kenneborn athlete, was probably the most complete quarterback in the Catholic League as far as running and passing is concerned since Tyrone Clark led St. Aloysius to the first championship in 1955. When you saw Butch on the field, he was everything advertised. Uh, Butch, tough athlete. We, we played, we ran track against each other. Uh, good, good guy, nice guy, very, very competitive. Jesuit's captain was Jack Laborde, a large tailback who carried the hopes of the Blue Jays. Jack Laborde, he was a he was a real go-getter. He, he was a hard runner and uh, he was a real smart player too. He, he was the type of kid that uh, everybody would like to have on their team. In 1966, gone from the Jesuit sidelines, the master of the single wing, Ken Tarzetti. He got sick and he was in the hospital. And uh, I told him if he ever came back, he could have his job back, which not too many people would do, I don't think. <laughs> Two years later, Ken Tarzetti died at age 43. Jesuit's program was placed in the hands of Ray Coates. He really wanted to be a success and he knew he was close, just getting that Jesuit job, which he had dreamed for for a long time, I'm sure. And so he wasn't a, he wasn't a pusher. He was a, let's go, let's do this together. Coach was probably one of the brightest football minds of anyone I've ever been around. He was just a, a genius. For five seasons, Coates would coach the Blue Jays, and like Tarzetti, he did not have a losing year. Following the 1970 season, a year after winning nine of 11 games and a share of the Catholic League title, Coach was fired as head coach after an altercation with a Jesuit administrator. Seemed like it was pressure from within and pressure amongst everybody wanted to see you win. Of course, my record states that uh, never had a losing season. He remained a teacher at the school until his retirement in 1988. Catholic League play opened with the rivalry. 
Here they come, number one in the state, undefeated, unscored on. You want, you know, you want to play this game? You know, and you know they had Butch Dewey, they had Ratman, they had Lyon, they had Santani, they had a kid who played behind Dewey, Waddingney. They had the names you knew, you played against them a couple of years, but you read about them. They were the team, they were the golden team that year. Dewey led a typical callback or grinded out offense that would wear down its opponents, especially the league's two newcomers, putting up 61 points against Shaw and 44 against Rummel. They had talent, they had running backs, they had a quarterback, they, had, they just had a lot of kids. And we always thought we were kind of out, out, outmanned. Even Dewey's star could now shine the Tigers' defense. He figured they're going to go all year without anybody scoring on And Coach Callbacker could instill that kind of, you know, wonderful pride in them. Uh, tremendous stories, tremendous kids, tough kids, you know. I think we got out that night and we went home pretty quick. We got beat up pretty good that night. Holy Cross has some hardest hitting tacklers the league has ever seen. The combination of Larry Arthurs, Miles Casbon, Tom Besselman, Ray Hester, and Larry Godet staged one of the best defensive performances in this city's prep history for stopping opposing backs in their tracks. Holy Cross dominated the game, but gave up its first points of the season in the 20-7 victory. Later at Tulane University, former foe, now teammate Ray Hester, let Laborde know how disappointed Holy Cross was by that one score. He, he one night, he, he comes in my room, he says, you know, you scored against us that night. First guy to score on us that year. I, I didn't remember that. And he says, you know, when you got up, somebody stepped on your hand. That did break my hand that night. But I didn't realize until three years later, when he told me the story, that maybe it wasn't right. Maybe it wasn't the nicest guy on earth who did it to me. Both Dewey and Laborde were heavily recruited. Dewey's family had always envisioned him playing for LSU. He called me up one day and he said, I'm signing with LSU tomorrow. I said, good for you. And he says, don't come. I said, I don't think I'm going to come to LSU. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at some other places. And, and he said, I'd rather not, I'd rather not compete against you at LSU. Surprisingly to me, he was better than I was. His potential was never known. And Herman Butch Dewey and his promising life came to a tragic end in Baton Rouge. Coach McClendon had kept Butch off of the football field the whole time. And Butch was, they were dragging him down. Uh, and, uh, and, and he was uh, in the dressing room and I asked him, I said, Butch, if the football's doing this to you, you need to get out of football. And then uh, what happened was he, uh, he had that cyst, that floating cyst in his brain and boom, he passed away that day. And uh, it was a traumatic event. I mean, Charlie Mack was uh, panicked, everybody was. It was just a horrible day. And I ended up having to take all of his stuff packing his room and taking it home to his family. He was having some headaches and having this kind of problems, and I know it probably would, had come before that. But, uh, it's a shock just like today when you hear one of your friends passes away, whether it's heart or cancer, whatever. It's always a shock, but that was probably one of, and one of my uh, early times where a friend is gone and you're not gonna see him again. Another great athlete and another name that will live forever in the history of the glory days. We hope you're enjoying part one of our Glory Days program. We've been working on Glory Days for over a year now, and we're so very excited to be able to present it to you. Programming like this is made possible by viewers like you who call in or go online and make a pledge. And when you make a pledge, we have several thank you gifts because at LAE, we're very thankful for your support. To make a pledge, please call 1-800-600-2068 or you can go online to WLAE.com and click on the Glory Days Pledge Merchandise button. Now, here's Jason to tell you all about the great pledge items we have for you. Jason? Thanks, Chriselle. For your contribution of $50, we'd love to send you this print of the 1940 Jesuit versus Holy Cross game at City Park's Tad Gormley Stadium. Over 34,000 
5,000 fans attended this great prep contest. This print measures approximately 5 by 17 inches and will look great in your office or at home. At the $80 level, we have Glory Days, the Catholic League of New Orleans coffee table book. This photo journal is filled with hundreds of fantastic pictures and captions from one of the greatest heirs of prep football in New Orleans. Nearly all of the schools that played in the league are represented in the book. Holy Cross, Jesuit, St. Aloysius, Holy Name of Mary, Redemptress, Chalmette, Shaw, Rummel, St. Augustine, De La Salle, Coriezu, and Brother Martin. This is a must for fans of the Catholic League and is only available through this pledge offer. For your contribution of $100, we'll send you a DVD of the Glory Days program that you're watching now. This item will be a lasting tribute to players, coaches, and fans of the game and the league loved by so many in our city. Remember, all of these items are not sold in stores and are only available as you support public television on LAE. And of course, we have some great packages, and here's Chriselle to tell us about that. Thanks, Jason. For your contribution of $200, we'll send you our Glory Days Champions Club package, which includes the Tad Gormley poster, the Glory Days coffee table book, and the Glory Days DVD. Separately priced, these items go for a total of $230, but today they're yours with your pledge of $200. And finally, for your contribution of $300, we'll send you the ultimate Glory Days package, which includes the Tad Gormley poster, the Glory Days coffee table book, the Glory Days DVD, a Glory Days ball cap, an autographed copy of Ron Bracado's book, The Golden Game, and a specially designed poster by our artists here at WLAE. Known as the Gallery of Glory, this poster features iconic images of players and coaches representing many of the schools that played in the Catholic League. The Ultimate Glory Days package is only available through this special offer on LAE. Thank you so much for supporting this incredible program on LAE. It's because of your support that we are able to bring you programs like Glory Days and all of the other great programs we produce. So please pick up the phone now and call in your pledge and take advantage of one of these great offers. The phone number is 1-800-600-2068 or you can order online at WLAE.com and click on the Glory Days Pledge Offer button. Right now, let's go to the producer of Glory Days, Tom Gregory, who's going to introduce us to a very special guest. Tom? Thanks, Chriselle. I'm joined today by executive producers for Glory Days, Ron Yeager and Jim Dotson. Guys, thanks for being with us today. And Ron, let me ask you, how did this project get started? You know, Tom, we had just come off with a highly successful uh, Fats Domino walking back to New Orleans project, and uh, I was talking with Jim and said, you know, what are we going to do for a follow-up? And in the back of my mind, I've, I've always thought that a project about the Catholic League would make a great documentary. Um, as a young boy, I grew up in New Orleans, uh, right next door to head Brother Martin football coach Bob Conlon. And as a young boy, I went to many games at City Park Stadium with the Conlon family and really got... Um, to know about the Catholic League as, as a youngster. And then later on I went to Jesuit High School and uh, was involved in the Catholic League then. So I kind of had an idea about what it was all about and I knew there were probably some great stories and um, I just kind of went with that. and. Um, Got in touch with Peter Finney from the Clarion Herald, and Peter put us in touch with Ron Bracado, who's been around for a long time writing about the Catholic League, and kind of sat down with Ron and kind of flushed it out, and then we took off. Now, it has definitely taken off. Jim, are you surprised with the response that this program has gotten? Yeah, I'm a bit uh, surprised. The, the response has been overwhelming from the, the corporate community and the, and the public. Uh, you know, we've had some great, great sponsors come on board, uh, led by Domino's Pizza, uh, First NBC, and uh, AT&T. And these are some just some great partners that we have on board with us. And uh, really, the, the public has also embraced it. A number of, of people have signed up to, uh, to get the pre-order the DVD. And, and the other uh, items we have for pledge and it's just been overwhelming and uh, we just can't thank the community enough for stepping up and helping support this project. And it's more than a story about football or the Catholic League. It's a story of the city of New Orleans and the people that call it home. Absolutely. It, it, is, it is something that is unique to this area to have a Catholic League of schools that played each other every single year. I think Jesuit Holy Cross played this year for the 92nd time. So I don't know that that exists in other towns. Um, but, you know, with the Catholic League maybe being dismantled for the next few years, this might be 
the history that we're capturing, it may never come back to where it was. We hope that it does, but, but if it doesn't, we have a snapshot that can be um, something that people can look at years from now and have a great remembrance of what it was. Gentlemen, thank you for the snapshot. Thank you for the documentary. And now let's go back to Jason, who's going to recap our special offers. Thanks, Tom. The number to call is 1-800-600-2068, or you can go online and pledge at WLAE.com. Here's a recap of tonight's offerings. At the $50 level, we have the Tad Gormley poster. At the $80 level, we have the Glory Days coffee table book. At the $100 level, we have the Glory Days DVD. At the $200 level, you get the Glory Days Champions Club package. This includes the Tad Gormley poster, the coffee table book, and the DVD. Save $30 and you get three great thank you gifts when you pledge at the $200 level. And finally, at the $300 level, you get the Ultimate Glory Days package, which includes the Tad Gormley poster, the coffee table book, the DVD, a Glory Days ball cap, an autographed copy of Ron Bercato's book, The Golden Game, when prep football was king in New Orleans, and a specially designed poster, The Gallery of Glory, featuring great players and coaches from many of the schools that played in the Catholic League. Call in your pledge now, or you can go online at WLAE.com and click on the Glory Days Pledge merchandise button. Thanks for supporting public television and LAE. Now, back to Glory Days, the Catholic League of New Orleans. It was a time when the racial divide went beyond the water fountains and lunch counters and into the schools. The most important victory of 1967 did not come on the football field. It came at a federal courtroom in the spring. St. Augustine High School finally won its fight against racism and the political machine. Since opening in 1951, St. Augustine was the flagship school of the New Orleans African-American community. The Purple Knights dominated the Louisiana Athletic and Literary Organization, the LIALO, a league comprised of African-American schools. St. Augustine principal, Father Robert Grant, wanted his students to achieve the most they could out of their Catholic education. And he realized that if they were part of the Catholic League, they would have this opportunity. You had the sit-ins, you had uh, lunch counters being uh, integrated and all, and Father wanted to show that African Americans could play as well as the, uh, the white kids could in a given league. St. Aug's Father Grant made his official request for LHSAA membership in 1964, asking specifically that his school be added to District 5 3A, the Catholic League. His request was denied. Instead, LHSAA Commissioner Muddy Waters transplanted three Bayou area schools into the district. St. Augustine was effectively locked out. Despite the rejection, Father Grant continued his quest. He applied to the LHSAA again in the spring of 1966, and he ran into more barriers. Mr. Davis was the athletic director. He'd go to meetings. Everybody would get up and sit on the opposite side of the room from him. He left him sitting alone. Finally, in 1967, with the two Terrebonne schools and Thibodeau out of the district, Father Grant was able to secure a favorable vote by the principals of the Catholic League. But now the General Assembly of the LHSAA voted against St. Aug's admission by an embarrassing tally of 184 to 11. Father Grant took the St. Aug case to federal court and sued the LHSAA for admission. We had to get a court order uh, in order to uh, get into the LHSAA. And we had, it, well, we ended up winning the court order and uh, they admitted us immediately in 1967. In the spring of that year, victory came for St. Augustine off the field. U.S. District Judge Fred Hebe publicly berated Commissioner Muddy Waters for discriminating and demanded that he allow St. Augustine into the LHSAA. Father Robert Grant's dream was finally realized. St. Augustine had taken its place in the Catholic League. In three years of fighting to join the LHSAA, the Purple Knights had won 49 of its 59 games, including three LIALO championships. 
but the battles were just starting for St. Augustine. We knew that uh, we had to be better than the people that we were playing. St. Augustine immediately became the largest team in the district, and the fans came out to witness the dawning of a new era of the Catholic League. They opened the league with St. Aloysius, and we went to scout the game and see the game in that. And uh, there was about 23,000 people in Tad Gormley that night. I had never seen that many people in my time in Tad Gormley, 23,000. And they beat St. Aloysius that night. And I think it opened everybody's eyes in the Catholic League like, whoa, there's something here. Watch out. The Purple Knights' successful league debut set up the long-awaited collision with Holy Cross's Tigers. John Callbacker's team was the unanimous choice to win the state championship in 1967. 67, they were loaded. They were just loaded. St. Aug's team had confidence coming off a perfect season. Remember, we were 26 and 0. I didn't know what it was to lose a football game to my senior year. A line of public service buses dropped off thousands of fans into City Park as the crowd and anticipation grew all day for the three o'clock kickoff. When the two teams entered the field for their pregame warmups, they were greeted by a deafening roar from a capacity crowd that numbered far more than the 24,500-seat stadium could hold. St. Aug versus Holy Cross on a Saturday afternoon, 26,000-plus, okay? I'm sitting in the stands, and I look, and I had never seen the curve Filled. Matter of fact, I don't think you could find a seat in this in Gormley. It was history. And, um, you know, when we walked on the field uh, in the beginning of the game or to, or to go warm up, they, uh, it just, the crowd was incredible because City Park Stadium was packed. And uh, it was just, it was just electric. Just to walk in that stadium and see 26,000 people for a high school football game was electrifying, and the game was electrifying. This was the two, the two uh, powerhouses in the city of New Orleans. I gotta admit that I was somewhat nervous and, and, and distracted by Holy Cross because of what they stood for. They were the champions of that district, and uh, we saw film on them, and they looked pretty sharp to us. It was exciting because they were a good football team, and they just come back from winning the state championship in their league. Um, but, uh, you know, Coach Carlbeck always had his way of motivating you, and, and um, it wasn't necessarily who you were playing, it was how we were going to play. And uh, if, uh, if I wouldn't have known St. Aug was a black school, I wouldn't have known it until we, we hit that field. Holy Cross had jumped out way in front, and all of a sudden St. Aug started clicking and came back. I figured we, would, we could score on them, and we did, but we just didn't score enough. Holy Cross jumped out to a 21-7 lead by halftime. Floyd Sandal and Richard Solomon got the Purple Knights back into the game by scoring touchdowns apiece. But Holy Cross defense eventually stiffened. St. Augustine's didn't. They couldn't stop this little do-everything back. Kenny Ratman, who scored touchdowns on a 46-yard pass from Watney, and then later another touchdown on a short run. I remember seeing Kenny Ratman though, break two on us. I remember that. A late safety when Chuck Knowles tackled Solomon in the end zone assured Holy Cross for 29-21 victory. From that game on, for the rest of the season, the two powerhouses of New Orleans traveled separate destinies. For Holy Cross, their path led to the state championship. After capturing the Catholic League crown, the Tigers roared through the playoffs. They coasted past Bogalusa and Chalmette. Against undefeated Woodlawn, Holy Cross's face quarterback named Joseph Ferguson, who is well on his way of breaking the Louisiana high school passing records of another Woodlawn player, Terry Bradshaw. In front of 18,000 spectators in City Park, the future NFL great was shut down, and Holy Cross headed to the finals with a 25-13 victory. On the night Holy Cross met the airline Vikings for the state championship, the temperature was 34 degrees. Light flurries coated the state fairgrounds field in Shreveport. Not only had the weather turned, so did fortune. 
Airline dominated the game and in the end took home the state trophy. We could have played in 10 foot of snow, I didn't care. Because I, wa I wanted to uh, repeat what the 63 team had done. But the shadows of one icy night is more than outshined by the memories of the glory of the Holy Cross Tigers of the 60s. Playing with Butch Dewey, the St. Hall game, uh, winning 13 in a row. You know, they, uh, there aren't no bad memories. But for the Purple Knights of St. Aug, the highlight reel ended after the game against Holy Cross. They lost the next week as well to Jesuit 13 to seven. But their problems had just begun. And the state went in and investigated them for whatever reason, why they went in there and said that they, some of their classes were not state approved. Say that we weren't taking the right subjects or some area about the academics that we, we had listed, but we didn't have them under the listed uh, protocol that they wanted us to list it under. And I think it was a reading course, I'm not sure, uh, that sometime later, some years later, became part of the curriculum. LHSAA commissioner, Muddy Waters, made a surprise visit to the school during the week of the Jesuit preparation. He asked Father Robert Grant, the principal, to show him the school's academic records, particularly the football team's ac academic records. Waters discovered that several players were not carrying a full scholastic load as defined by LHSAA guidelines. St. Augustine was led to believe that what they were doing were within Louisiana educational guidelines. Waters declared 19 players, many of them starters, ineligible to compete again for a full year. And after that, they had a disastrous year. They never won another football game the rest of the year. They lost them all. We didn't have any voice in LHS at the time, you know, just being uh, in there for the first year and everything else, we had to take all the punishment that we, you know, we had on the chin and uh, to just stop up ourselves and just get ready to play the next game and go on from there. St. Aug coaches and players found more obstacles on the field. Remember, I was a kid. I just wanted to play and I wanted to be treated fairly. And I, I wasn't being treated fairly. I, I knew that much because we moved the ball 40, 50 yards on one play, and at the last minute, here comes the flag. And he had to move it back, score the touchdown. They would call that back. And uh, I can recall walking back to the huddle saying, saying things like, you know, when is this gonna stop? Why don't you just let us play? And, and I think the kids that we played against at that time felt the same way. It was the adults that was the problem, the officials. But because of the way they played, and by the way, the players, coaches, and administrators of St. Aug dealt with difficulty, they forever transformed the Catholic League. I think they served notice when they played St. Aug Wishes and Holy Cross and Jesuit, and they were able to play with those three schools. It kind of told the Catholic League, you now have a new member, and, and you know, St. Augustine is gonna have to be dealt with. In 1968 was a year of assassinations, demonstrations, and unrest. Traditions were transforming, and there was more change in store for the Catholic League. Coached by Joe Rotano, De La Salle won the Catholic League championship in 68 and 69. In 1969, the Cavaliers swept the district on their way to a 10 and two season and the state's number two ranking. The team boasted perhaps the finest two-way lineman in Louisiana prep history in Tyler LaFosse. Tyler LaFosse was the leader of that team, both offensively and defensively. He was a guard on offense, a nose tackle on defense. He was one of the most outstanding athletes. He was, uh, you know, pretty well built, uh, heavy, heavy kid lineman, uh, short but but stocky and you know he was the, probably the best lineman that's ever come through De La Salle and maybe the state. He's the only player to this date to be named to the All-State team 
the same year on both offense and defense. Besides LaFosse's gridiron greatness, there was another happening in the Catholic League that would transform the conference. The story had its start a hundred years before. The Brothers of the Sacred Heart opened St. Aloysius on September 26, 1869 with only six students. The Treme School was one of the charter members of the Catholic League with a football history that dated back to 1921. As the Crescent City's population grew, the brothers opened another institution on Elysian Fields. Bariesia was started in 1954 as a school that would be sort of like an experiment to show that it was going to stress academics and it would not have athletics. That was Brother Martin's concept. But that concept began to change in 1965 when students began to drop out of Koryezu to attend other Catholic schools with athletic programs. Brother Martin was put here as the uh, president of the school and he kind of oversaw the building of the gym and the things that were necessary. It's kind of ironic because he was the one that had the concept of a school without sports in the first place, but now he was put here to, uh, to build the gym and to get, get the necessary facilities to go into sports. Brother Martin, who as Provincial Superior of the Brothers of the Sacred Heart from 1949 to 1958, was a founder of the New Orleans Catholic League but he might have wondered what Koryezu got themselves into with the school's first football team in 1965. Well, there's an old saying, you gotta learn to crawl before you walk, and we did a lot of crawling. The Kingsmen, coached by Gene Borg, lost all seven of their games. It became obvious that if this upstart was gonna be successful against the older, more established schools, it would need to attract talented athletes. It was tough because we couldn't, we had no, no athletes were there because they wanted to play, you know. The athletes that we had there just couldn't get in Aloysius or wherever else they wanted to go. So it, it took a lot of time, a lot of effort. But, I, you know, I thought we, we rose pretty quickly there. Corrier's who then brought in Andy Bushwives as head football coach and athletic director. Bushwives was a star in on St. Aloysius' 1955 Catholic League championship team. Andy, I know Andy, when he coached football, he used to think that he had to show them they had to have mental toughness. And I can remember the day before the game, we'd go out and scrimmage. And we ended up losing a lot of games in the fourth period because we were, we were dead tired in the game the next day, you know. But uh, the goals, I think, were just to develop the toughness and, and the, uh, the desire to play. You know, the ones that stayed, they, they enjoyed playing. Even though they took a good kick, and they, they enjoyed playing. In 1968, Koryezu, the school that shunned athletics, was ready to take its place in the Catholic League. Bourgeois assembled a coaching staff that included Chubby Marks and Bobby Conlon. It became obvious that if this new school in Gentilly was gonna become successful, it would have to attract bigger and stronger athletes from the playgrounds. On the playgrounds of New Orleans, where the talent developed, Bourgeois was busy creating a foundation for future gridiron glory. Under Bourgeois, when they started their football team, they were extremely aggressive on the playground. You know, you had to get involved with the coaches at the playgrounds, so because if, you know, if they saw the interest, they'd send their kids our way. They would throw a big steak dinner for all the playground coaches in the metropolitan area. And I mean, I, I'm coaching at Jesuit at the time and I know this is going on. And of course, back then it was, it was legal to do all that. And, and all the playground coaches, you'd hear them say, man, I had two steaks the other night and this was really great. And of course, by them getting the kids that they were getting, in 1971, when they did win the state championship, all those kids that they had, were playground kids. But in 1968, a championship was not even in the picture. But glory was attainable for the Kingsmen in a game against their sister school, St. Aloysius. We tried to warn the, the players on the team that because they weren't taking Koryezu particularly seriously, it was a new kid on the block, and we tried to warn them this is going to be their Super Bowl. Although the two schools, which were run by the Brothers of the Sacred Heart, had never met each other on a football field, there was still some degree of animosity 
when they met for the first time at City Park. Coriezu surprised its more experienced opponent by jumping out to a 7-0 lead right in the first period when a center snap caused St. Aloysius quarterback and punter Dennis Sabrio to shank a punt that carried only one yard. Seven plays later, quarterback Bobby Greasehaber's 10-yard pass to Bobby Tremer produced the touchdown. The larger and more experienced Crusaders bounced back just before halftime on a 44-yard pass from Sabrio to Al Breedy. That set up all-district running back Joe Winkler's one-yard touchdown run. The Kingsmen took the 7-6 lead into the fourth quarter, where St. Aloysius scored what appeared to be the deciding touchdown with 7.55 left to play. The Crusaders moved the ball 55 yards on three plays with the go-ahead touchdown coming on a 50-yard pass from Sabrio to John Schmidt. This time, the PAT was good, giving the Crimson a 13-7 lead. With just 1.27 on the clock, Coriezu took possession of the ball at midfield following a Crusader punt. As the clock continued to tick, Greasehaber passed to Steve Hooks for 22 yards and a first and goal at the Crusader 8. The little quarterback then floated the ball to Tremer in the back of the end zone, just out of reach of Winkler for the tying touchdown. Sure enough, they scored in the last uh, minutes of play and, and kicked the winning extra point and won the game 14-13. to 13. And uh, they, of course, went wild with that. And... Uh, Unfortunately, what we were predicting came true. The two schools would eventually merge, and Coriezu had bragging rights for life. I know they didn't want to hurt the Coriezu people. They didn't want to hurt the Aloysius people, so the brothers came up with, with Brother Martin High School. And I know Brother Martin personally did not want the school named after him. He really objected to that. But the brothers voted, and they overruled him, really. I really think we could have advanced they would have better alumni, they'd had better support getting money and things like that. Because, uh, you know, Aloysius was well known for all those years. But uh, that's just the way it worked out. You know, but as an Aloysius alumni, I was hoping it would be named Aloysius. I was. To me, that was kind of a, a real big loss to, I think, to prep history. And, and also to, a, to how many graduates out there that we had that uh, St. Aloysius just kind of it's hard for, for me as a St. Aloysius graduate to tell students and tell people, you know, well, where'd you go to school? I went to St. Aloysius. Huh? St. Aloysius? Where was that? And then you have to go through the spiel. Well, St. Aloysius is now Brother Martin. Uh, you can't look back, can't change history. You got to make the best of the present situation. For the most part, most of them knew that could understand the decision and they were basically if the brothers decide to do this, we're still loyal to the brothers of the Sacred Heart. In the very near future, you're not going to have many St. Aloysius alumni around. So in the future, you're going to have Brother Martin and only Brother Martin. And they deserve all our support. Having consolidated with the new name of Brother Martin, the school would retain the Aloysius mascot of Crusaders and the Coriezu colors of scarlet and old gold. For those that put on the uniforms of St. Aloysius or Coriezu or Holy Name of Mary or Redemptorist, their glory gained did not fade with the passing of time nor the closing of their schools. For each player, each participant, and for all the fans of the Catholic League, the moments and the memories of the competition have made them all better prepared for their own life journeys. It was four of the finest years of my life. If I had it to do all over again, would I do it? Yeah. I wouldn't have swapped it for the world. Thank the good Lord I had the opportunity to participate. The Catholic League will always be a part of New Orleans that was important. What was left on the field of the Catholic League has become the foundation of our present and our future. Their duty done conquers the shadows of time. No laurel wreath needs to be placed upon their heads because the gridiron remembers it all. 
These are stories, you know, that, that carry throughout your life and you're never gonna forget. But the story of the Catholic League does not end here. The Catholic League gave Louisiana something to, for everybody to cheer about. Uh, from Shreveport to Monroe to Lake Charles, Baton Rouge, Alexandria, everybody knew the Catholic League. In the following decades, the league grew and more legends were made and many more names became mythic. Otis Washington. Henry Randall. Joe Z. Easton Roth. And everybody knows Bob Conlon. Bobby Conlon. Sammy Martin. Those guys attack you like a swarm of ants. The super ants, huh? <laughs> Before you knew it, everybody around school was calling us the super ants. Shaw became Shaw when John Fourcade went to Shaw. Competition is fierce. The Catholic League was the epitome of football. We played in the toughest league in the state. In the following decades, the journey continues and the story grows. Stories about those who on the field of the Catholic League left behind them not just their all, but their glory. days the Catholic League of New Orleans is made possible by our presenting partners Domino's Pizza the pizza delivery experts first NBC your community bank where you matter and AT&T rethink possible and by the New Orleans Saints Lakeside Camera Photo Works Buson Creative Strategies the Almar Foundation Capital One Bank Gibbs Construction Southern Eagle Distributors, New Orleans Museum of Art, Generosity Media, and the Tipitinas Foundation. Hi, I'm Jay Thomas, and it has truly been my pleasure to be a part of this great documentary. As a football player for Jesuit, I had the privilege of playing for Coach Ken Tarzetti, and uh, one of my greatest memories is when he turned to me and he said, son, all the good players are hurt, get in the game. Uh, my brother Tim was truly a star when he played during the Pat Screen years, but I wouldn't give up what happened to me in those glory days of the Catholic League for anything. And this has been an incredible trip down memory lane for me, my family, and I'm sure for a lot of you out there, especially the guys from Holy Cross and De La Salle that we enjoyed beating so much. Thank you. And these guys at LAE, 
need and deserve all of our support to help us relive one of the great eras of high school sports in New Orleans. Now in a minute, the folks here at LAE are gonna tell you about some great gift items that they have when you call in with your pledge. I'm asking you to call the number that's on the screen right now, or you can go online and make a pledge. I agree to support this project because I believe helping get programs like this off the ground and on the screen is something very exciting in television, in film, and of course for local communities like New Orleans. I hope you do the same. Thanks for watching. We had a blast bringing all of this to life. And now here's Jason to tell us about some great pledge offers. Thanks, Jay. Here's a recap of tonight's offerings. At the $50 level, we have the Tad Gormley poster. At the $80 level, we have the Glory Days coffee table book. At the $100 level, we have the Glory Days DVD. At the $200 level, you get the Glory Days Champions Club package. This includes the Tad Gormley poster, the coffee table book, and the DVD. Save $30 and you get three great thank you gifts when you pledge at the $200 level. And finally, at the $300 level, you get the Ultimate Glory Days package, which includes the Tad Gormley poster, the coffee table book, the DVD, a Glory Days ball cap, an autographed copy of Ron Bracado's book, The Golden Game, when prep football was king in New Orleans, and a specially designed poster, The Gallery of Glory, featuring great players and coaches from many of the schools that played in the Catholic League. Call in your pledge now, or you can go online at WLAE.com and click on the Glory Days Pledge 